right. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm very grateful to present my paper uh, in this seminar. Um, well, I hope uh, it's it is a good fit. I'm not I'm not actually sure. <laughs> my paper is actually about public disclosures in the context of uh, global games. Um, and I think most of the other papers that were presented in the seminar is in the market context or more of an IO context, but I hope uh, you will find the paper or my presentation interesting enough. Um, all right, so um, as uh, Bernard introduced, uh, my paper is titled uh, Information Inequality and the Role of Public Information. Um, it's a co-author co paper with my colleague at Yonsei University. Um, and let me, uh, yeah. So let me start out with the motivation. Um, uh, so economic agents, like individuals, get uh, their private information from many different sources. Um, some people have like access to sources that are very precise, uh, or some people do not. Right, uh, and those sources being private, um, so that kind of creates information inequality uh, across agents. Um, and technically, I, I will refer that to non-homogeneity of private information quality. Um, so when there's information inequality of this kind, uh, we can think about what ways, what it, what are the ways to reduce such inequality. Um, one way might be for government agency or central banks to like disclose more transparent public information to kind of offset the inequality in the private information. Um, so my paper school is to answer the following questions. So is this policy, is this public disclosure of uh, being more transparent in terms of the public information disclosure, is this always socially desirable? Um, and can agents benefit even when there is information inequality? So those are the two questions, two main questions that I aim to answer through this paper. Um, so as you can see, when we talk about public disclosure, we have to talk about more extension. So starting uh, with more extension, a large literature has uh, studied the social value of public information. So our paper like complements this line of research because we also consider the welfare eff effects of public disclosure. And you can think about my paper, uh, our paper as a direct extension of Morrison Shin. Um, uh, one point of departure is that while the most of the papers in this line focuses on exposed information heterogeneity, we also allow for ex-ante information heterogeneity in the sense that I explained just before that the private information quality differs um, among the agents. So that's one difference. Our paper is also closely related to James and Lawler, 2012. Um, they, their like setting, their question is very similar. Um, the, th there are two differences. They focus on the environment where agents' actions are strategic complements. Um, on the other hand, we also allow for the case of substitutability. So that's one uh, departure from their paper. Uh, the other is, uh, it may seem a little bit uh, trivial, but private information precision differs between two groups in both of our paper and their paper. But James and Lawler assume um, uh, that each of those two groups comprise half of the population. Right. which mainly they do that for the simplicity of the analysis. And we agree with that, but I think we have a little bit interesting comparative statics in terms of the proportion of those two groups. So the, that's the two departures. Um, so our paper kind of as an extension to Morris and Shin, we study how how the information inequality coupled with better public information impacts uh, equilibrium behavior as well as social welfare. Um, all right. All right. 
So preview of results, I kind of like listed uh, most of the results that we have. Um, it's kind of wordy, so I'm gonna be very brief on it. Uh, um, so two kind of takeaway is that first, uh, if there is information inequality, uh, we kind of complement Morris and Shin's uh, uh, conclusion uh, about decreasing welfare with public information, that with information inequality, it is more likely that public information might decrease welfare. That's one uh, result. Uh, the second one um, is if like, given the information inequality, let's say if there's more of the people that are better informed in terms of private information, or if the better informed get even better uh, quality information, right? I would just say like rich, the rich getting richer kind of situation. If that's the case, uh, the welfare unambiguously increases, right? So it kind of, uh, I'm not suggesting that information inequality causes welfare to increase, but I'm saying that social welfare could increase even if it means that information inequality is widening across uh, the agents. Um, so the two big uh, results. Um, so let me give you a, the, the roadmap. I'm just gonna go into the model, show you the equilibrium and the results uh, regarding the equilibrium behavior and social welfare. All right. All right. All right. So it kind of, it directly extends, as I said, the beauty contest model of uh, Morrison Shin. Um, but uh, one difference is that we also allow for substitutability and also for an accenti uh, non-homogeneity in, in the private information quality. So I'm gonna briefly go over the model. Um, so in the economy, there is a continuum of agents uh, all indexed by I and uniformly distributed over the interval zero to one. And they want to take an action um, that depends on the exogenous random variable representing the state of the economy. So I assume that it's the theta and theta is drawn from our normal distribution with the mean P and the variance uh, one over alpha P. The agents would observe two signals. Um, one is public signal, the other is noisy private signal. And the public signal they receive is just about the mean of an exogenous random variable that represents the fundamentals of the economy. Right? So just the mean of the fundamentals, they observe that as a public signal. Um, the, the one, uh, the important thing is that they observe noisy private signal, which I denote as X uh, sub I uh, superscript T. Um, so each agent gets the noisy private signal. Um, and after that, they choose an action, A I uh, with the superscript T. I'm gonna explain, explain the T later, but first the payoff, um, the payoff is going to be uh, depending like the age, basically it's the more ascension setting. Um, the agents wants to be uh, as close as possible to the true fundamentals, as well as they, the, their action also depends on the actions of the other players, other agents, um, but it depends on the parameter R. If R is positive, it's the strategic complementarity setting. So in that setting, um, they want to be close to the average action of the other players. Um, on the other hand, if it's uh, the case of R less than zero, it's the substitutability case. Right? In that case, they will be uh, penalized if they are, they are, their actions clo are, are close together to the average action, right? So they want to differentiate when it's substitutability case. They want to align their actions together when it's the complementarity case, right? As well as they always want to be close to the fundamentals, right? That's what the payoff represents here. Um, all, right. all right, so the, the, the important departure from the, 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 the 
the literature is that each agent is going to be characterized by the precision of the private signal that each of the agent receives. Um, there's two types. Uh, I'm going to denote it as T, which can be either H or L. So high representing the high type, L representing the low type. So the private signal I specify here uh, is going to be the theta plus the noisy term, noise term, right, where uh, alpha xt represents the precision of the private signal, right? Um, and the idiosyncratic noise epsilon follows a uh, normal distribution, a uh, standard normal distribution. Um, right. So uh, as I said, there are two types. So either the low type, high type, and as you can uh, see from the notation itself, high type represents uh, the type that has a greater precision, higher precision of the private information or private signal, right? So let's just assume alpha XL is just alpha X uh, for some alpha X value. Um, alpha XH is going to be the mu times alpha X. So it's a higher than alpha, just, just plain alpha X where mu is greater than one. Right? So you can think about mu as capturing the, the magnitude or the discrepancy between the two quality uh, two quality types. Right? So it's the magnitude of the extenti difference between the precisions of the two types private signals. And I'm just going to call that information inequality. So we can think about if the mu is getting bigger, the gap between the two type qualities are getting uh, getting bigger. So the information inequality widens. Um, uh, also, uh, chi, I'm gonna assume that to be the fraction of agents of the high type in the population, right? So the chi proportion of the high types, the one minus chi proportion of the low types. Uh, in the population. All right. So the characterization of the equilibrium is just along the same line with Morris and Shen, right? There is a linear equilibrium and it's going to be the unique equilibrium. And the equilibrium action, right, is going to be characterized uh, by uh, the weights of the each agent Oh, uh, of that that they that they rely on either the private information that they get, the private signal or the public signal, right? So it's comprised of two things: um, the how how much they rely on the private information, how much they rely on the public information, and that weight depends on the lambda, and the lambda differs between the two types uh, of the age. And the lambda is characterized by this. I'm going to explain this later, but the literature calls these uh, lambda weights the sensitivity of equilibrium actions to private information relative to public information for the agents, for the agents, right? So if there is no, no two type, um, then there's go just going to be one lambda. And we're going to compare these lambda H and lambda L to the more sentient case with one uh, lambda. Um, but for now, let's just uh, uh, skip the, the more detailed explanation of what these mean. Um, uh, Jane, do, do you do you yes. have some do you have some intuition for condition one? Which type which types of environments are excluded under that condition? Yes. So uh, thank you for that question. I can I can actually that's the next slide. So condition one, um, I think uh, the reason that we need the condition one is because of how we formulated the the two types. Uh, we, we just had the alpha X fixed and with the mu and that kind of creates for like, for example, for a very large mu um, that one like proportion of the agents having like really, really great uh, private information. Um, then in that case, that group of people actually turns out in equilibrium, they uh, rely on only on their private information without relying on any public information. So that's still the, the that's going to be uh, the, the equilibrium. 
but we want to just focus on the case where uh, the, the agent um, rely both on private and, 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 and public information, right? So condition one basically guarantees that lambda H for the high type um, is less than one. In my setting, the lambda L is always less than one, but uh, the condition one guarantees that lambda H also stays less than one. Right. And it kind of, it always holds if, if R is greater than zero, means like in the strategic complementarity case, if it's not a problem, but it may fail when it's uh, a strategic substitutability case. And I, I just have like one example of the parameter um, values that violates condition one, which is like you need to like have a very a high level of substitutability such as uh, uh, minus 0.9. Oh, and I, I, I think I didn't mention R has to be between minus one and one. Um, and, and yeah, so minus 0.9 being very strong uh, substitutability in actions. Uh, chi has to be like small. I mean, these are all has to, are intertwined with each other, but chi has to be very small, uh, mu very big and so on. Like, so I kind of interpret it as like a very special case, right? Where it's very strong substitutability uh, with one like small portion of agents that have like very, very good private information, right? In that case, this condition fails. And in that case, the, the high type agents would only rely on their private information and just ignore the public information. But I just want to rule out that case and look at what we think is the more interesting case of where uh, agents uh, rely both on private and public information. Um, all right, so that was condition one. So we're gonna look at the results. Um, so this lambda weight, like the, the dependency on private or public information, like given the signals, how much they would rely on the public and private information. And I'm gonna look at first the comparative statics of lambda, the, that, that lambda weights in, in terms of the public information. And this, uh, Result is it's just a consistent result to Morrison Shin, which says like if public information is more precise, the agent will rely more on public information, right? Than on on relative to private information. Very intuitive. Like if public information is more transparent, you get better public information. You rely more on public information, right? So I'm gonna just skip briefly on that. But the important part, I think is the comparison of our lambdas to the Morrison Shin case. Um, so we are gonna rewrite our lambdas as this, um, and it's going to be kind of the ratio of the delta to the average delta. So where delta H is the relative precision of private information for the high type, right? It's defined as alpha X over alpha X plus alpha P for the high type. Right, delta L is the relative precision of private information for the low type, right? So your weight on private information directly depends on your relative precision of private information to public information, right? And also it depends on the average of those two weighted by the proportion of the high type and the low type agents, right? So this, look very similar to Morrison Chen's counterpart, uh, which in terms of our notation, it's going to be same as setting mu equal to one. And the lambda weight just is commensurate with the relative precision of private information to uh, public information. Um, so that looks like this. And our for, uh, lemma, lemma one, gives the direct comparison between these three values. And you can see um, that when it's strategic complementarity case, uh, the agents rely more on private information relative to the Morrison Shin setting, both of the agents. 
but uh, one one diff uh, one thing that was interesting is that when it's strategic substitutability case, the high type agent still relies more, even more strongly to private information than the more extension case, but the low type agents rely less and rely more on public information than compared to the more extension uh, counter part. Right. Um, and um, it kind of contrasts with what James and Lawler does. Um, in their case, uh, they have a very similar setting with ours. Um, and in their case, the high type agents rely more on public information, whereas in our setting, the high type agents rely more on private information. And when I was actually um, uh, writing the paper, comparing our paper with the, the result with James and Lauder. I kind of, we didn't, we, uh, my co-author and uh, I couldn't really figure out why that's the case because the setting looked really similar. It's basically the same. Um, but now I, as I kind of revise, I'm in the, in, the, in the process of revising my paper. Um, now we think it's not, our paper is not contrasting James and Lauder, I think. Um, it's because where we take the baseline of the comparison in their paper, like they have, so they, we have the more extension, um, we have the alpha X as the more extensions of private information quality, and we add another type of one, another group of agents, which has a higher precision than the more extension case, right? I think what James and Lawler did was they actually add the lower type. Right, so I think the results can be kind of combined with theirs. Uh, we haven't been, uh, we have, we, we are in the process of revising the paper so that we can more complement um, the uh, the results of James and Lawler. Um, but yeah, that's uh, still in the rough version. Um, all right. So what we we have new is that oh, James and Lawler doesn't. Uh, uh, consider the case of strategic substitutes, but we have the new results of, of in the case of strategic substitutes, where, as I said, the high type and the low types, they behave differently in the opposite way. And I'm gonna explain the intuition just in a bit. Um, so let's uh, have the result um, where we do the comparative statics of the equilibrium behavior that's characterized by lambda um, in terms of chi. Um, and we find that when it's strategic complements, um, uh, lambda t for both of the agents uh, rely more on, on private information when uh, the proportion of privately better informed, the high type agents uh, are higher. Right, so a high, higher proportion of privately better informed agents induces both types of agents to respond more strongly to private information when it's complements, but the, the opposite happens when it's uh, strategic substitutes. Um, so we can gain on why this is the case by just looking at the looking at the, the, the terms technically, right? We can decompose both of the lambda L and lambda H in comparison with just the lambda in the Morris and Shen case. And we see that there is an additional term for both of the both types of agents, right? And we just call that the residual sens sensitivity of equilibrium actions to private information and CEL for the low type, CEH for the high type. And we can easily see that if R is greater than zero, um, CEL um, is going to be positive as well as CEH. Um, but when it, R is less than zero, right, this term is going to be negative, whereas a CEH remains to be positive because you can, we, can, we can easily verify that this term in the parenthesis is always positive, uh, regardless of whether R is positive or not, right? So that kind of confirms why the, the intuition behind, the technical insights behind lemma one. And for the proposition three, 
right, for this comparative statics, we can also see that CEL and CEH both increase in chi only if and only if R is greater than zero, right? So these are just technical explanations. So I'm gonna give you a little bit more uh, intuitive explanations behind the result. Um, so the driving force behind Proposition three is that the average quality of private information in the entire population actually increases when relatively more agents uh, receive better quality of private information, right? What well, chi increasing is it means that there are relatively more agents in the population that receive high quality private information. Right, so when that happens, the average relative precision of private information in the entire population increases. And that's actually the key channel why the results hold, right? With, when actions are strategic complements, agents want to align their actions to each other, or in more generally, they want to align their actions with the average action of all the agents, right? So with an improvement in the average quality of private information, each um, agent will realize that other agents on average will now respond more strongly to private information, right? So when they want to also align their actions to the average action, um, they would rely more on private information when R is greater than zero, but the opposite happens when R is less than zero. Right? So that's kind of the intuitive explanation um, of the comparative statics that I just showed you. Um, right. Okay. So the next result is the comparative statics uh, with respect to not the proportion of the better informed, but the quality of the better informed agents, right? The mu, right? Mu increasing means that the quality of the already better informed agents are getting even better, right? What happens in that case to the equilibrium behavior. And it kind of also, I, I put uh, in the slide that it kind of contradicts, but I, we're trying to combine it with their results. But um, they find it when it's more pronounced, the, the informational gap, the more the high type agents rely more on public information, which um, in, uh, in our case, the, the more pronounced the informational gap, meaning if mu increases, the more the high type agents actually rely on private information. And I think also because it's the, the I think the difference between what the, the baseline is for the comparison, um, but also what's different from James and Lola is then that when it's R is less than zero in the strategic substitutability case, the two types of agents also behave in an opposite manner. Um, and I think the intuition here is interesting. Um, so I'm gonna give you also a technical explanations for it, right? So if we decompose further the lambda H, right? The, the one term that I showed you before, the CEH can be decomposed into two terms, one of which is actually the residual term for the low type, right? So it's kind of the common residual term for both of the type of agents, right? Um, while the high type also has an additional term, right? Which I call IE. And it's, I think it's kind of, we can think about it as a pure informational effect, right? Be due to the better private information that they receive in terms of mu, right? And you can see that the first term is positive positive when R is greater than zero, but is negative when R is less than zero, right? But the second term is always positive. Um, so when, um, um, when R is positive, right? The low type agents always rely more on private information, right? As well as the high type, right? But it, the, 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 they, um, when R is negative, they react in a different way, right? Because this term is negative, but 
for the high tab, you have to combine the two additional term where the first term is negative, the second term is positive, right? And the, the second term actually dominates, or the third term actually dominates the second term in terms of the mathematical expression, but I will also show you uh, the driving force behind it, right? It's actually the same driving force uh, as with uh, the previous uh, result. Um, it's through the, the better quality on average in the population, right? Re whether or not like there are more proportion of agents with better informed or better informed agents getting even better in private information, the average quality of private information in the entire population increases, right? And that's the driving force um, because now with an improvement with the average quality of private information, um, when actions are, let me, let me put it this way, when actions are complements, right? Both of the agents, they desire to align with what others do on average. Right? So they would, on average, respond more strongly to private information, right? That's captured by CEL being positive. Um, when actions are substitutes, both of types of agents would desire to do the opposite of what others do on average, right? So they would both respond less strongly to private information, right? That's captured by the negative CEL term, right, in that case. Um, but in addition to that, the high time agents also recognize that regardless of their complementarity or substitutability, the low time agent would necessarily respond less strongly to private information than themselves simply because the low type private information is comparatively even poorer, right? So this kind of consideration creates uh, uh, the tendency for the high type agents to actually respond even more strongly to private information when uh, the R is less than zero, right? So that kind of dominates the effect of the negative effects created by CEL for the high type, right? All right. So um, that was our results for the equilibrium behavior. I'm gonna go on to the social welfare part. All right, the social welfare evaluated at equilibrium is this, it's the weighted, it's the normalized average of individual utilities. And because there are two types of agents, you can think about the equilibrium expected welfare being the weighted average of the expected utilities for both of each of the agent with the weights being the proportion of the agents in the population. And we can formulate the expected utility for the agent of each type um, as, as uh, in terms of the lambdas. Um, and our first result deals with um, one diff like the, the big difference between Morris and Shen is that they only have one type of agents, right? So the formula is much more simpler than ours just with the addition of just one more type, it kind of creates a very uh, complex um, uh, uh, formulas for our results. So in the slide, I'm just gonna abbreviate all the complex uh, inequalities, but I'm gonna try to explain it, how it connects to the more extensions result. Um, and we decomposed the two, we, before looking at the social welfare, we decomposed uh, the, the, the comparative statics for each of the type. Um, and what happens for each of the types expected utility when public information gets better. And then we're gonna combine that to social welfare uh, analysis with respect to public information uh, along the line of um, restitution. Okay. So we derive a necessary and sufficient conditions for the expected utility for each of the agents to decrease in terms of uh, alpha P, which is the precision of public information. Right? And we have this necessary and sufficient condition for it. And this necessary and sufficient 
sufficient condition can hold if the sufficient condition five and seven hold, right? All right, just let's leave it at that and I'm gonna come back to that. Um, if we plot for an example of parameters, um, the expected utility of the high type, the expected utility of the low type and the social welfare, the combination of the two, it, it looks like this. And we can kind of, by the illustration, confirm that there is a region where the social welfare as well as the expected utility for each of the type uh, of agent decreases with public information alpha p. So there are ranges of parameter values where social welfare can decrease, right? So, so um, that kind of directs us to our corollary, which is the ex direct extension of more ascension. So even in the presence of information inequality, there exists a set of parameter values for which more precise public information lowers social welfare. Um, and that um, parallels the findings of Morrison Shin and also James and Lawler. Um, in their case, like with they only look at the strategic complementary case, right? And they derive the conditions where it is not always the case that greater precision of public information is socially desirable, right? That's the famous condition for decreasing welfare, right? We can actually uh, connect that with our conditions to more essential condition, right? For us, it becomes a little bit complex as we can see in here, but by letting mu equal to one in our setting, it directly gives us the Morrison Shin condition. So we can retrieve Morrison Shin condition by setting mu equal to one, right? Where the Morrison Shin conditions say that if R is greater than half, then there are going to be ranges of parameter values where public information lowers social welfare. And that range of parameter values specifically is characterized by the second condition here. Right? And that with strong, so it basically means that with strong, strong complementarity, such that R is greater than half, if the agent's private information is very high relative to public information, right, then um, more precise public information can be harmful to social welfare. Right? So the greater the precision of the agent's private information, the more likely it is that the, um, the, the more transparent public information disclosure would lower social welfare, right? That was their conclusion. And it actually directly applies to ours um, because this, these conditions say, like it looks very similar to uh, more sentient sufficient condition. So it also says with sufficiently strong complementarity, uh, the greater precision, great, the greater the precision of the private information, whether it being for the low type or the high type, right? Either in terms of alpha X or mu, right, the more likely the public information will reduce welfare. Right? So that's kind of the connection between the two. Um, I'm gonna try to come back to that intuition uh, with a picture later, but uh, before that, I will give you our result uh, of social welfare comparative statics uh, with respect to CHI, the proportion of the better informed. Um, and social welfare, we find that social welfare increases with an increase in the proportion of the better informed agents. Um, and it, it's kind of the intuition also can be gained uh, from Morris and Shin's finding because this proposition six or Morris and Shin's finding that an improvement, improvement in the precision of private information is beneficial to welfare. You can think of that as a special case of our uh, setting, right? Because the two extreme cases of chi equal to zero or chi equal to one is 
the case where there's not no heterogeneity in private information, right? So it corresponds to the more extension case of increasing the private information precision from alpha x to mu alpha x for all agents, right? So it's kind of the two extreme case. So we can expect that if there are, is relatively more agents, higher k high agents with better quality information in the population that will also improve welfare. Um, kind of I'm trying to explain the intuition behind the proof and the proof also shows that each agent's equilibrium expected utility also increases in chi. So if there are more proportion of better informed agents, not only their utility increases, but also the low type, the, the relatively not well-informed agents utility also increases. And both of their utilities increasing induces social welfare to increase as well. So the next one is also very simple uh, in, in terms of the intuition. Um, so social welfare also increases with an increase in mu, right? So now it's not the proportion of the better informed, but it's rather the better informed agent's quality of private information is getting even better, right? So this is also a direct is extension uh, of more extensions finding that more precise private information is beneficial to welfare, but we kind of have three uh, things, points uh, that are kind of, we think is important here. Um, this result holds regardless of the size of chi, so regardless of, of whether there's very small number of agents with better information or not. And also, as with the previous proposition, the equilibrium expected utility for each type also increases in chi, right? So what this means, right? Where, whereas the Morris and Shin uh, argued that more precise information is beneficial to welfare, we can add on to that by saying more precise private information only for some of the agents, it's it's also beneficial to welfare, but not only beneficial to welfare, it will be beneficial to all of the agents in the population. And also regardless of whether those agents getting better private information is very small or very large. And the third point that we want to make is that this result also holds for mu less than one. And that kind of created a lot of questions before. So we tried to reconcile it in our revised version. I think the version of the paper that, that, uh, um, that's been distributed uh, doesn't have this uh, interpretation, but we added that afterward. Um, so an increase in mu when it's greater than one represents the increase in equality in private information, right? That's uh, because the better informed are getting better. Um, the, the increase in mu when it's lower than one, right, represents decrease in equality because now if mu is less than one, it means that the poor agents in terms of information are getting better, right? So there's decrease in inequality. So our mo model focuses on mu greater than one. There's the, the baseline um, type of agent and there's the high quality uh, type of agents. Um, so how are we going to interpret our previous proposition seven where social welfare increases with an increase in mu, right? We are not trying to say that uh, the greater information inequality causes uh, social welfare to increase because that's not the direct that's not the, the, the effect here the regardless of whether mu is greater than one or not the immediate effect of an increase in 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 mu is an improvement in the average relative quality of private information and we that was the key source for all the uh, the previous results that we had before the the delta uh the bar the delta bar right that's, that's the key channel for the increased welfare, right? The, what, what we are trying to argue here is that more precise private information for some agents is beneficial to welfare um, 
regardless of whether the group of agents getting better private information is already better informed or not, saying like it's kind of including uh, whether or not like mu is greater than one or mu is less than one. But when it's mu is greater than one, the result just implies that social welfare can improve even when it's also accompanied with greater information inequality. Right? So I hope that kind of clarifies the, the interpretation of our result. Do I have a few, I think 10 more minutes. So um, this figure uh, illustrates um, so alpha p, it's the it's a previous it's, it's the previous figure right plotting only the social welfare not the expected utility of the, each of the agent right in terms of alpha p right so mu equal one is the case for more ascension and the dotted green line and the dotted uh, red lines are the ones for mu equal two and mu equal to four right so if we can see that when mu is going up, the welfare is also going up vertically, right? But we can also see that with public information getting better, there are ranges of parameter values where social welfare is reduced, right? So combining those two, like we can also see that the minimum welfare levels for different mu's, and we kind of plotted that with the black dotted line here is upward sloping, indicating that, of course, uh, that for a higher value of mu, social welfare is decreasing in public information for a wider range of parameter values, um, right? Kind of combining our comparative statics with respect to mu and the comparative statics with respect to alpha p, right? So this is also um, maybe, yeah. Yes, I just explained this. And this is also in contrast with James and Lawler's discussion where they actually say the opposite, um, where um, with better public in, uh, in their setting with two types, the set of the, the range is actually smaller then in the Morris and Shin framework, the range for where uh, the public information reduces welfare. And now when we were actually comparing, we didn't quite get why that was the case, but now we kind of see they were only looking at, they were actually looking at the case where mu is less than one, right? So they would be plotting their welfare function uh, below the blue line, right? So you can see that the range that the social welfare falls in, in, in alpha p is decreasing, right? Because of this line, right? All right, so although uh, we have uh, this Benson's argument that social welfare is unlikely de to decrease uh, under reasonable assumptions and parameters because uh, they, they uh, the paper thinks that, uh, where is it? The, this kind of condition is very hard to satisfy to, for the welfare to decrease, right? So that kind of argument may remain qualitatively intact, but our, the one important implication of our observation is that with larger information disparities among economic agents, there may be greater possibility that public information may be harmful to welfare. So that's one takeaway from our last result. All right. So um, I think our analysis has some policy implications for the debate on public disclosures by government agencies or central banks, like whether to have more transparent public information disclosed to the public. Um, James and Lawler actually has one additional feature. They actually model public disclosure in terms of the proportion of agents to whom public information is released. Um, but we, we fix the proportion. We say like if public information is released, it is released to all the agents regardless of the types of the agents, 
right? We only model it in terms of the degree of transparency. So in terms of alpha P, for example, like if, if the government wants to disclose more transparent uh, public information, it means that the alpha P is increasing, right? That's the one difference. And while our paper can be seen as a direct extension of Morrison's chin in the sense that we also show that increased public disclosure can be detrimental to social welfare. What we want to highlight is that such effect, such detrimental effect of public information is more likely when there is greater informational inequality among agents. Right. So, so just some, some concluding remarks in formulating disclosure policies on how much to disclose. It, it is important to carefully identify the informational structure, of course, um, that economic agents face. Otherwise, if, if tr increased transparency trying to um, um, decrease the information inequality, well, it actually can render socially undesirable outcomes um, which would be counter to the policymakers' goals. Right. So, thank you for uh, listening to my seminar, and I will take uh, questions if the audience has questions. <laughs>